went from Telegraph to Twitter. My name is Jovan Kurbalea. I'm director of Deeper Foundation and executive coordinator of Geneva Internet Platform. And we are particularly honored to organize uh, this event with the permanent mission of Austria, represented by Ambassador Thomas Heinetzi, and the permanent mission of Serbia, represented by um, Ambassador Vladislav Mladenovic. Uh, we have uh, today uh, with us uh, honorary professor of uh, political history from Graduate Institute here in Geneva, and uh, vice president of Diplo Fond uh, Foundation, Professor Andre Libich. We have a great, uh, great panel, and I can see that in the audience we have a quite nice mix of uh, ambassadors uh, representing the uh, United States, uh, Montenegro, Estonia, Latvia. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that I will miss some of the honorary representatives. Representatives from the ICT community, uh, including the, the uh, Matthias, who prepared the recent diplomacy report. Where are you, Matthias? Yeah. Is over there. I'm sure there will be some questions on free prophecy. Uh, now, just uh, before I pass the floor to uh, Ambassador uh, Heinz and uh, Ambassador Mladenovic for their introductory remarks, let me just make a few comments about the Geneva Internet Platform, where we are today. It is the uh, uh, initiative of Swiss authorities operated by Diplo Foundation, with the main purpose to create a place where the discussion on Internet as a tool for diplomats and Internet as a uh, topic on diplomatic agendas could be addressed. Uh, we have been organizing a training seminar, the awareness based uh, building event. They would like to invite uh, missions and other players to join us in these uh, activities. Now, without uh, further ado, I would like to invite um, Ambassador Heinitzi to um, uh, uh, make a few introductory remarks. Thomas. Thank you so much, uh, Johan, and uh, I might just add, I participated in one of your training events, it was very good, I can recommend it. And I would like to uh, welcome you all, uh, dear colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, to this event. A hundred years ago, the First World War started, and then many commemorative events uh, uh, all over Europe and even beyond, and uh, so and we got them this idea, how could we do something meaningful, future-oriented here in Geneva, if possible, with a link to our activities here uh, in the international organizations. And one thing was clear for me, when we do something, I want to do it together with Serbia, with my good friend Vladislav. And Jovan, uh, 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 has written quite an interesting little essay on uh, the issue at that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, Telegraph was really en vogue. It was a little bit like the Internet uh, within the last 20 years. I mean, people were enthusiastic about it. And then when it came to the big crisis uh, at the beginning of the First World War, uh, there were some mishaps, uh, problems, we will hear more about this, and um, so communication can have a bearing on even peace and war. And of course then today we have the internet, and I think whatever we do in such commemorative events, it should be future-oriented, so I think it's quite interesting for us to look, what would it look like today, the role of internet, that might create problems, uh, what might be conducive to a peaceful solution of a crisis. And it is often told that uh, we should learn from history. And then there's the other saying, uh, history is a teacher, but this teacher doesn't have any pupils. So I think you are now the proof to the contrary here <laughs> in this room. I think uh, uh, we can learn something from experiences in the past and try to make it better in the future. And with this, I would like to pass on the microphone to my plan for uh, what is left, my servant, uh, th Thank you, Thomas. Well, I would like to join uh, Dr. Johan Kurbalia and Ambassador Thomas Kainetzi in welcoming you to this seminar from uh, Telegraph to Twitter. At uh, uh, 11.10 a.m. on the 28th of July, 1914, 
a telegram was sent from Count Leopold von Berthold, uh, the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, to Nikola Pašić, the prime minister of uh, Serbia and the foreign minister, who received it at 12.30 uh, uh, p.m. And this telegram was a declaration of war, we all know. This year we are commemorating 100 years uh, for this, from the start of the First World War, uh, the war that had devastating effects on Serbia, on Austria, on Europe, and the whole world. Austria and Serbia today are partners and friends. Serbia is a candidate for the European Union, and Austria is one of our closest uh, allies and supporters. We also work closely together in uh, different international fora in, in regarding uh, improvement of peace and security in the world and, of course, uh, in human rights. We have our history and we have our common future. Most of the seminars and uh, roundtables that have been organized and that will be organized this year will deal with the issue of the causes and the consequences of the First World War. Uh, this uh, today's seminar is uh, something completely different. It is unique because uh, it will look at something uh, uh, which is related to the development of technology and the experience of the use of the telegraph and the internet in diplomacy. Means of communications have uh, uh, advanced dramatically uh, over the years. How much can uh, this help, and how much uh, can it uh, complicate? Uh, relations between countries, that is the question. Is there a lesson to be learned in the internet era from uh, the telegraph and the outbreak of the First World War? We, bet, uh, we don't have a better representative than Dr. Leon Kurban yet to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Madanis. Well, that's, that's, that's a tough question. We'll try today to, to do as much as uh, as we can, at least. Uh, but you just indi indicated and, uh, and, uh, that uh, Ambassador Kainos about lessons from history, what we can learn. And I always like the smart and the wisdom of uh, Mark Twain, who said that, that we cannot learn from history, but uh, history doesn't provide lessons, but it uh, provides rhymes. Therefore, there is uh, some sort of music that we should detect and uh, and uh, get and uh, thank you for uh, for setting the stage for uh, for our discussion and uh, for this uh, lovely uh, symbolism of having uh, Austria and Serbia on this important occasion uh, discussing the future and use of technology and the future of technology and diplomacy. Uh, we have uh, today um, um, an excellent um, representative of historical science, and I will reveal one secret: uh, why we got. Uh, Small research in perfumes and how, what was the situation with the perfumes back before the First World War and Second World War? And I can tell you, our female staff love this research. They they did a really really thorough visits to the uh, perfumers in Geneva. Uh, Professor Andrew Liebig uh, uh, was delivering one of the most exciting uh, courses in history, combining um, both uh, his. Uh, enormous uh, knowledge and eloquence in history, but also uh, bringing the atmosphere of the time. Music, uh, film, um, I don't know if you experimented with perfumes, Andre, you would have to tell us. <laughs> but uh, that was, uh, he, is, he is one of the major inspirer of my research on, on technology and diplomacy, and this multimedia idea to organize this event. Well, uh, Andre, without further ado, I would like to invite you to give us the historical context for our discussion. Thank you very much, Jovan. Uh, uh, I think in this case, the, uh, the student has surpassed the, the teacher uh, with your perfumes in particular. Uh, after what you said about uh, Mark Twain, I fear that I should have seen my shock, <laughs> but uh, I'll spare you that. I, I, I'll also spare you a rundown of the events which we are concerned with, because they're, they're well known. You remember them from uh, school books, and if not, uh, you have many occasions to be reminded of them on television and in the media generally now, which uh, is speaking a lot about uh, uh, July 1914. Uh, our focus here is on technology, on the possibilities and the dangers of technology. 
So the thing which I would like to raise here is that of manipulation, as evidenced in July 1914, perhaps with some thoughts uh, forward. I want to speak about manipulation of technology, manipulation of time, and manipulation of expertise. Let me begin with uh, manipulation of technology. There are some examples of uh, efforts to manipulate technology in July 1914 that are very well known. Uh, we know, for instance, that the French president, Poincaré, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Viviani, were in Petersburg in July 1914. Uh, Vienna knew that they wouldn't have good communications on the sea voyage back to France, so Vienna waited with the ultimatum to Serbia uh, so to make sure that Poincaré would not be able uh, to take uh, quick measures with his Russian allies. Uh, similarly, uh, the French ambassador in, um, in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Paleolog, sent a telegram about Russian mobilization in 1914, which took 10 to 12 hours to reach uh, Paris. It's not clear whether there was interference uh, which was voluntary uh, uh, by, by Germany or whether it was simply uh, uh, overload on the telegraph uh, wires. Another example, perhaps, of manipulation uh, of uh, technology in the same period uh, was when uh, Tsar Nicholas uh, changed his mind several times on mobilization. Yes, no, yes. Well, when finally the generals got what they wanted, general mobilization, uh, the Minister of the, uh, of the War, Sukhom Linov, uh, uh, said, uh, cut the telephone wires so that we don't have any more messages from the Tsar. So there are, there, are, there are ways of manipulating technology. What is very interesting is that already then, in 1914, there was fear of technological manipulation. Ambassador uh, uh, Nadine uh, referred to the telegram which uh, Prime Minister Passage received from Vienna declaring war. She received it in this unusual form because uh, uh, Austria-Hungary had already cut off diplomatic relations and its ambassador had left. So there's no one to deliver the telegram. Uh, the telegram was sent in an uncoded form, and Patrick at first thought it was what we would call today a scam. In other words, he refused, he refused to believe that this was really what it intended to be. On the other side of, of the continent, Joffre, who was the uh, uh, chief of staff of the French army, had intelligence about uh, the likely direction of German attacks, because there were code breakers at the time who were quite effective. But he refused to act on it. He received the intelligence and he knew better, so uh, he believed that the German attack would come through Alsace-Lorraine and was prepared for that. Well, I think these examples show us both the possibilities and the limitations of manipulation. They show us that already 100 years ago, uh, one could play with technology, People were suspicious of technology. Sometimes the suspicions were well founded. Sometimes they were not. Let me turn now to another type of manipulation, which is the manipulation of time. Some things should go fast, and other things should go slow. In the case of July 1914, there was a harmful slowness, notably because it took almost a month for Vienna to issue the ultimatum to, Ser to Serbia. For various reasons, I've mentioned the Pankaro visit in Petersburg. Uh, the soldiers of the Australian army also were on leave for crop work and were not to be called back. Um, bureaucracy interfered with uh, decisions and with technology, even then, as it does today. Most historians are in agreement that had the ultimatum come immediately after the assassination, and the declaration of war also within a few days, it would have made much more of, uh, of an acceptable impact on European public opinion. In other words, uh, there would have been much more understanding for the Austro-Hungarian uh, position, whereas the delay uh, made the, the whole matter seem more contrived than it needed to be. So there was slowness which was harmful uh, to uh, one party, at least, in, in 1914. And then there was also a rush, which was unseemly and unnecessary. When uh, Passage received uh, uh, the ultimatum, 
which was eventually rejected. Uh, he appealed to the difficulty of getting together his cabinet uh, within the very short time frame that was given to him, within 48 hours. Um, he was on an election campaign. His ministers were also uh, in the country. Well, the Austro-Hungarian minister said, look, uh, in a country your size, with railways, you can get the, you can get the cabinet together within six hours. Well, that was perhaps a dig in the size of Serbia at the time. It was perhaps also an exaggeration, but it did suggest that uh, uh, procrastination was not dictated by technology. In the case of Russia, too, Russia began mobilization early because it knew that mobilization would take much longer. And this was certainly a contributing factor uh, to the decision to go to war, because even as uh, the Kaiser was exchanging letters with his cousin, the, the Tsar, dear Willy, dear Nikki, in English, uh, the Kaiser, when he learned that uh, Russia was already mobilizing, found that this was a, a shameful evidence of Russia's uh, bad faith. So, technology puts pressure on us to act fast, which may be beneficial. Um, one should have strike when the iron is hot, as the saying goes. One has the advantage of surprise. But also the compression of time removes the possibility of thinking, of reflecting. And so we have a double-edged uh, uh, sword in the manipulation of time. Let me talk last about the manipulation of, uh, of expertise. Some authorities in 1914 didn't know what others were planning and were prepared to leave the planning to the others. Notably, civilian authority didn't know what the military was up to. When the Kaiser hesitated about uh, uh, engaging in war on the Western Front, Moltke, who was his chief of staff, told him it's too late. Uh, the trains are moving. This is the famous war by timetable that A.J.P. Taylor wrote about. Uh, and this also applies to, to Russian mobilization in 1914. Uh, partial mobilization was in the books, was, uh, existed theoretically, but because the railway hub was in Warsaw, it meant that mobilization would have to be really on two fronts, against both Germany and Austria-Hungary. No one bothered telling the Tsar this until, of course, it was quite, quite late. Mm -hmm. Sometimes two military authorities uh, themselves uh, are in the dark because their comrades or colleagues won't tell them what is happening. For instance, in 1914, there were British plans for British expeditionary force to be sent to the continent. But the Royal Navy didn't know about them, so it made no plans for transporting this ex expeditionary force. Well, all this suggests that um, civilian authority must keep up on technology. Not only is war too important to be left to the generals, but technology is too important to be left to the IT people. Being theologically literate is a survival skill. It could have been so in 1914, and it still is today. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. I just noticed that uh, IT people were very busy taking notes, so there were quite a few comments and uh, questions. Uh, let me just uh, present now the, our uh, summary of our study of comparing the era before 1914 and uh, our time. Uh, you will receive the copy of this study um, um, after this. Just leave us an uh, email, or I think we have it through the registration. And, and a few follow up uh, comments. One of the Excellent uh, practice which BBC introduced um, uh, on the occasion of the celebration of commemoration of the First World War. They have a short uh, podcast every day, basically summarizing the atmosphere. They started on 28th of June, and every day they have a short podcast summarizing atmosphere in the international community in London. And I start my morning with this four minute uh, podcast just to immerse myself into that era and uh, that time. And uh, this morning podcast was that uh, uh, the shopping was in full swing in London. The ladies were very excited about uh, the big reduction of uh, prices, and we are speaking about 1914. 
and there were some news coming from uh, from the from Vienna and from from Belgrade, but it wasn't the major thing. That describes well and uh, the start of July crisis, and we have July uh, as the diplomatic attempts to solve the problem, and then we have so-called August madness, when the, basically the Europe went uh, absolutely ballistic. Uh, everybody was so excited, celebrating a uh, future war without knowing what will start in just in a few months. Today, we will make a 10 parallels between development at that time, prior to the 1914, with the major focus on July crisis, what was happening in diplomacy, and how Telegraph contributed to, the, to, to these developments. Uh, first general observation, we'll start with Zuma uh, perspective, is that the Telegraph, on the left-hand side, and internet have uh, uh, basically many fathers, and uh, we listed the eight, but the list on the fathers of telegraph is about 2025, 20, starting from the the first inventor of mechanic telegraph in 1794 in France, up to to uh, uh, Marconi and those who started wireless telegraph. On the right hand side, you have internet fathers with the Queen, we have, you have from the left side uh, uh, Vincer, uh, Robert Kahn, uh, Tim Bernard Lee, and uh, Louis Poussin, and uh, one who, uh, Mark Anderson, who invented the browser, internet browser, he apparently didn't attend uh, this, uh, this event. What is the message of this fatherhood or paternity of the, of the both telegraph the internet? First, the reason why we have such type of invention was that in UK in the 19th century, the first scientific journals and communities and societies were introduced. Exchange of information started among scientists. And then they were comparing notes and trying to uh, build something new. The reason why we had uh, so many um, uh, people involved in development of the internet is the funding of academic projects, mainly in the United States in the 60s and 70s and later on in the rest of the world. They were at the universities, mainly on the West Coast, inventing and the, the internet protocols and other tools. Second parallel between uh, two developments is uh, innovation is a smart balance between private initiatives and public uh, incentives. And it's fascinating when you analyze this development, how uh, similar this development was. In the case of Telegraph, it was the government who was uh, close enough to secure tenders and to secure services, mainly in the UK, while the most of innovation and invention was done by, uh, by private sector business. In the case of the internet, it was, uh, it was the academic community which led the major development. And I make another quite interesting historical parallels. In both cases, France was ahead of time. They invented the first mechanical telegram in 1794, and then they lost the competition, the main UK took over the developments of Telegraph. In the case of the internet, I don't know uh, those of you who are uh, on, on my age or slightly older, Kundry could recall a retail system, which was more or less internet-based idea, which existed in France a long time before the internet started. But Minitel didn't take off. And uh, we had uh, later on whole internet development. This is just an interesting historical parallel, probably for our colleagues from France to study why it happened twice in two centuries. The third uh, common point is the leading role of private sector. Here on the left hand side, you have so called Electra House, the seat of the uh, Eastern Telegraph, the biggest telecom operator of the 19th and early 20th century. 50% uh, of overall global traffic went through this house. This was high concentration of the cables coming through the UK. And 90% of the all telegraph traffic were owned by private sector. Today, instead of electric house, we have a Silicon Valley with a high concentration of the internet industry. And again, more or less the same percentage, 90% of the internet traffic is going through privately owned internet cables. Complete parallel. Fourth parallel. 
There is a famous saying that technology is neither good nor bad, nor it is neutral. Again, in the case of te Telegraph and the Internet, you have the same developments. Early enthusiasm, excitement about the Internet, Internet is a pushing frontiers, it will bring the, well, I don't know what's going on with my system, it will bring the more peaceful world, it will put us together, the conflicts will be overcome. And if you analyze the history of the Telegraph, it was the first phase from the 8060 for more or less till 8090. Then uh, smart people started misusing and abusing the Internet. And what was that when there were comments that Internet, uh, not a Telegraph, is not necessarily uh, good, it could be bad as well. We have the same development on the Internet side with early enthusiasm till, let's say, mid 90s, and then discovering cybercrime and all issues related uh, to the abuse of the Internet. And what is the most important, neither Telegraph nor Internet are neutral. They, like any technology, empower some people, companies, regions, and countries. And you have had redistribution of the power, both in the case of Telegraph and the Internet. The five parallel, which is fascinating, and I I've been really, really fascinated when I analyzed the literature from the beginning of the uh, 20th century was the discussion of the end of geography. Somehow, because of the excitement possibility that you can send a message across the, across the continent, people thought that we are living in a completely different era, the end of geography. And the first guy who realized that geography still matters was uh, John Tawell, who basically tried to escape with the railway uh, after committing crime in the Plymouth. But then through Telegraph, they uh, informed the uh, uh, Paddington Station in uh, London, and they caught him and uh, later on executed him. Uh, on the right hand side, you have the literature, the famous book, Death of Distance, which was published by Francis uh, Cancross, uh, economist, the journalist, 15 years ago. With the, with the excitement of the end, end of the geography, end of distance, end of university, and end of almost anything, including diplomacy, <laughs> that we survive. Now, Robert Kaplan wrote two years ago a book, a Revenge of Geography, and basically arguing geography is back, geography is back big time. Now, what we can see on these two maps on the bottom side is that the cables, telegraph and internet cables, are more or, less, more or less following the same routes, with heavy traffic going across the Atlantic Ocean, and then having the strategic route from the UK via Gibraltar, uh, Egypt, uh, Aden, towards the uh, Gulf and, and the Indian Ocean. Sixth parallel. Neutrality was one of the most frequently used terms in the telegraph negotiations. And uh, if you're following internet governance negotiation today, net neutrality is a big issue, especially after the recent ruling of the U.S. Uh, Federal Communication Commission. Now, the difference between neutrality in telegraph era was that it was neutrality of the telegraph cables, with the Germany, France, and the U.S. insisting that cables should be neutral in the case of the conflict. So nobody should cut the cables. UK resists, for obvious reasons, they control 75% of cables. And till today, the cables, in the cables are not neutral in the case of the military conflict. They can be cut by warring sides. It's an interesting line across the history. And, uh, you have the, my, my small idol is the lady from uh, Georgia who was uh, fixing her garden and uh, she cut the Georgian uh, and the, a cable which was connected by mistake to Georgia to the rest of the world. <laughs> they even wanted to prosecute her and uh, later on they decided that they should probably protect their cables, uh, cables better. It happened three or four years ago. On the top you have the question of net neutrality today. It's not about cables anymore. It's about the content. Should content have the same status when it's going through the cables? Or should it have the different status depending if it is a video? Uh, probably paid by comp uh, companies like uh, Netflix 
or uh, or some or your in my mail your your tweets. It's a big big issue mainly in the United States. Currently, there is a big internal debate in the United States, but I'm seeing it becoming also global issue, uh, uh, which will be discussed a lot in forthcoming period. Mm -hmm. Seventh uh, parallel is on privacy and surveillance. We think that it is the new issue privacy of surveillance, but if you analyze the ITU's uh, reports on the meeting, it was discussed since the establishment of the ITU in the 8065. They celebrated 150 uh, years of the, of the existence as the oldest international organization. And uh, the person who triggered the very heated debate was Mancini whose letters apparently, not telegraph letters, but normal letters, were opened under the instruction of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire because he was plotting uh, for the independence of Italy before, the, before it started in 1860s. And it was a big issue. And then the question of surveillance was expanded to telegraph. Today, uh, we have the whole issue of the internet surveillance triggered by uh, Snowden revelations and questions of the of the limits and then the scope of the of the surveillance uh, practices. Eight parallel, only two more. Technology became a new topic on diplomatic agendas. It triggered the establishment of the first international organization in the history, not only technological, it was the ITU in the 1865 in Paris. The second major development was Titanic catastrophe. Uh, and the reason was that IT was discussing for almost 20 years the question of regulation of radio telecommunication. And then, after the Titanic catastrophe, and especially after the failure to save the survivors, due to the miscommunication between Marconi's uh, telegraph and Telefunk and Telegraph, Marconi wanted to have monopoly, and he refused any international regulation. Therefore, basically, SOS signals which were born from the Marconi's telegraph set on the Titanic couldn't be followed on the other other uh, telephone can, uh, uh, sets. Therefore, ITU immediately reacted and governments agreed to have a radio telecommunication regulation. And that convention, in a few changes, is more or less in, uh, in uh, force today. On the right-hand side, we have Net Mondial 2014. Again, triggered by one uh, on the question of surveillance, that accelerated the question of internet governance and policy last year with the question of net mundial and uh, and discussions in the in different fora. Therefore, internet governance is becoming part of, if you can say, governance uh, uh, Premier League, discussed by many many fora worldwide, human rights, WTO, and ITU in mainly multi-stakeholder way, as we, we can see later on. This is the ninth parallel. Uh, ninth pa parallel is multi-stakeholderism. We usually, especially I'm part of IG community, sort of part of IG usual suspects, as we are called. And we tend to think that everything uh, starts with us, that we invented uh, this new way of uh, governance and uh, novelty. But when you, again, when I was studying the ITU, Papers that you can find, uh, for example, the 8071 ITU Plenipotentiary Conference in Rome basically discuss initial forum multi stakeholders. At that point, IT decided to invite private companies who were main players from the UK and USA to participate in ITU's activities without voting rights but as observers. And even today, you have a sector as members of the ITU for private companies. Here is important to mention one, let's say, inbuilt historical tension. Telegraph developed in the UK and the USA mainly through private initiatives. And it was self-regulated. In continental Europe, it was to the large extent government monopoly. Therefore, that element of tension existed in the ITU from the very beginning between privately owned uh, internet and uh, and the intergovernmental. Finally, last, thank you for your patience, but this one is a bit long. Is what, uh, what Andre introduces technology as a new tool for diplomatic activities. On the left hand side, you have Vienna Congress, probably the most successful event in the history of diplomacy. 
which lasted for one year. We will celebrate next year the conclusion of the Vienna Congress with a lot of fun, with a lot of uh, entertainment. But the result was one of the most successful treaties in the history of diplomacy, which kept some sort of global peace for almost 100 years, between 1814 and 2000, 2014. It wasn't a scientific treaty like uh, Versailles Treaty, which made a mess later on. It was basically a reasonable compromise of people who had a fun and uh, also negotiated in the, in, the, in the free time. And the uh, two chief artist, architects are Talleyrand, and Metternich, you can see their photos. What is the dynamics of the current diplomacy? You can see two images, and I can see that, uh, based on discussion with colleague diplomats in Geneva, that reflect the reality of diplomats. Uh, everything has to be done immediately, fast, uh, and uh, you have to do multitasking, especially for small missions. In the morning, you start with the uh, humanitarian issues, we move to human rights, in the afternoon to internet governance, and whatever is on the on the long long list, I can see from but uh, smiling in the <laughs> confirmation of that. This is a trans, trans, uh, transition. What Andre mentioned, uh, Andre mentioned, this is this time component. What is the difference between two ages? First, and I think the most important and completely under research false perception of presence, and you will see in a few minutes why it is important. Question of urgency, which Andre discussed, lack of coordinated communication, concise messages reduce context, emergence of ministries of foreign affairs, foreign policy bureaucracy, and centralization of diplomacy. First, false perception uh, of presence. When you read the diaries of the decision makers from the July 1914, their basically message is, we are not going to stop our holidays. We'll enjoy the uh, the second. We'll enjoy sailing in the, in the uh, Baltic Sea. And we have a telegraph. We are connected. And many ambassadors, many ministers of foreign affairs get that message. We are connect connected. Therefore, we know what is going on. And this is one of the strongest messages for the Internet era. And I'm uh, quite optimistic because I think decision makers realize that message. By, and if you analyze the three most recent breakthroughs in diplomatic negotiations, Myanmar transition, Kosovo arrangement, and Iran nuclear deal, all these three breakthroughs were done with the participation in situ, with real physical presence. And that element of presence, lack of the presence in 1914, to the large extent, the, the conflict. Urgency, time compression, uh, and here is the, my list of the, how the, the time was compressing, starting from the Austria's ultimatum to Serbia, it was 48 hours, Germany, Russia, 24 hours, Germany, France, 18 hours, and UK, Germany, five hours. I don't know how far they would go if they continue that way. But you can just imagine the relaxed time of uh, July or 1914. Time is perceived as almost endless, and suddenly you're receiving the messages that you have to provide answer in 12 hours or 20, 24 hours. That was unthinkable, and it caused the major, major professional shock to all uh, who, were, who were involved in this, this process. The second element is the coordinated communication or really uh, Nikki telegraph exchange. It's well known in history as the really Nikki exchange between Wilhelm II, Kaiser Wilhelm II, sitting in Berlin, and the Nicholas II sitting and in St. Petersburg. And here are the messages that they exchanged on 29th uh, of July uh, and 30th of July, which was the crucial period, immediately after the mobilization, mass mobilization, which was declared by Russia on 30th of July. The key messages, as you can see, two messages crossed each other. Uh, the first one, 1 a.m., 1.45, therefore they couldn't, they couldn't consult each other. They were written in English and they were uh, referring to each other as Billy and Nikki. They were very, very informal. Then the key message, in my view, was a message uh, coming from uh, Nikki, uh, Nicholas II, 
at 8.20 in the evening, 8.20, where he proposed to Kaiser William to uh, bring Austria and Serbia to The Hague for the negotiation in The Hague. At that time, peace negotiations were conducting mainly in The Hague. Now, there are the whole historical analysis. Apparently, the government machinery in Berlin didn't present this telegraph to the to the uh, Wilhelm II. So he didn't reply. His reply was completely out of the context next day on the 30th of July. And I'm usually uh, trying to insist on that miscommunication. The major explanation is that machinery, uh, especially Moltke, especially military, were tired of the diplomacy and negotiation that said, listen, forget any negotiation in the case, we have to, 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 to move on. There were very concise messages. Telegraph was expensive. Uh, it was like a Twitter for, for different reasons of the 19th century. And the context was always missing. And the context is diplomacy is the king. You need, uh, you need a lot of context. I'm not uh, uh, in favor of long text, but uh, there is the need to have a proper context. In the 19th century, diplomatic machinery established ministries of foreign affairs and telegraph to the large extent facilitated establishment of diplomatic machinery, which are more or less in the same form as ministries of foreign affairs today. It's bilateral uh, departments, multilateral consular diplomatic academies and other players. And the last element, which I'm sure we will see at the comments here, is the heavy centralization of diplomacy. Before telegraph, diplomats, ambassadors, representatives at the time, they were small kings. They had huge room for maneuver, to make initiatives, to negotiate. Suddenly, they were on remote control from the capitals. And that uh, really, uh, you have uh, the whole series of complaints of Ambassador of UK and also in, uh, of the telegraph, of the sort of diplomatic movies movement we have to destroy those device because they don't understand what's going on here on the spot and they're sending us instructions from the from the capital this is the uh, one and the last analogy last uh, element was that basically diplomats like statements from leaders which they were before telegraph became just the followers it just to follow the developments and they were there to introduce uh, execute the, the rules very often coming from military, but under mentioned military with the idea of planning, of mobilization, and uh, war by timeline, basically introduce scientific element in public policy. So, okay, you guys, diplomats, you negotiate, it's not very scientific. We have here plans minute by minute, and we know how to run the show. You should just take the sideline and follow what we order you. That was the one of the important elements. These parallels, political, practical, are to the large extent applicable to our time. And this is what our research, which you will receive, is analyzing in details. What we can learn, and what are these rhymes in the Mark Twain's words that we may listen from time to time. History is a complex. We cannot apply the lessons directly. But we can learn from the wisdom of time and from time, to, from time to time from mistakes that were committed in the past. That's uh, some short, uh, well, not that short, summary of, the, of our uh, research. And uh, I think with that, I would like to invite uh, um, our panelists for the comments and, uh, and the audience. Please, the floor is yours. We have also remote participants. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your invitation. I clearly thank the, the missions and the Diplo Foundation for this uh, for this uh, wonderful event and for this fair perspective on the um, uh, July crisis in uh, 1914 and the impact of the telegraph. Uh, I would like to say that um, the progress, or uh, no matter the criticism or, uh, or the, the concerns we legitimately have, both in uh, concerning the 
Telegram and the Open Internet, the progress has to be acknowledged, has to be acknowledged. She presented the Vienna Congress of 1814. However, in 1814, because the because of the slowness of the communications, the war between the uh, there was a war on North American continent that went on for three weeks more because the belligerents didn't really know that the war was ended. It was the, the war between the United States and Great Britain. And the two countries have concluded by Christmas of 1814 the peace. And the belligerents did fight on one very significant battle in New Orleans in, in January. So I think here that the progress has to be acknowledged. On the, uh, I mean, I understand why you focused on some aspects on uh, the, the July crisis. However, I think that the communications between the headquarters and the diplomats in posting are also very, uh, uh, in this period, are also very relevant. And here, especially, I mean, uh, especially for the, for the, some of them which are public now, for instance, the Foreign Office and the uh, British Ambassador in Berlin, or the other, the other way between the, between Berlin and the Ambassador in London are, are very useful, and also cover the aspects of news communications, uh, things that are left unsaid, and uh, uh, sometimes false assurances given by the diplomatic posting to its own host government. I think that that's, that's also a further uh, uh, scope for research. Thank you very much. Good. That's that's uh, the, the gold mine. I can tell you of this archives, and another another gold mine are the so-called colored books, because all players were to alibi alibi diplomacy. They want to say, okay, we are not guilty for that. And there was a massive production of colored books uh, after the First World War. It's quite detailed uh, documents and exchange, and there's definitely some resource for analysis. What's what's happened in that period? Thank you for that comment. Yes, that, that's uh, an important difference between now and 1814 is that we now have multilateral institutions which didn't exist at the time, with which it's not difficult for uh, uh, capitalists to communicate. One of the real problems in, in July 1814 was that uh, there were vague ideas uh, promoted by Edward Gray and others of having an international conference, but these never got off the ground in part because some of the parties didn't want them, but in part because it just would have meant uh, interrupting holidays, which is very important, uh, and getting people in, getting people together. Well, um, instead of a, of a uh, in, international conference, perhaps if there had been a convenient uh, social event, say if there had been a, a state funeral for Franz Ferdinand, uh, that would have brought together heads of state, and perhaps there had been negotiations then. But uh, the emperor made a point of not having a state funeral for, for, his, for his nephew. So a difference between now and then is that we do have, inter we do have multinational, uh, multilateral organizations which provide a forum where people can get together and sort out problems. Still, when one thinks of... Uh, say, the Georgian war a few years ago. It did take place uh, uh, in midsummer during the uh, uh, Olympics in Peking, when people really were distracted and were thinking of other things, as you suggested they were in the summer of 1914. So far, the World Cup is, uh, is uh, progressing without any major conflict. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Peter Mulrain from the U.S. Mission. I, I thank you. This is this is a fascinating discussion, and it, it's always interesting to to get a little perspective on what we think is is a new development, but um, perhaps just a new version of an old development. Um, and it it made me think that you know we 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 read a lot these days in diplomatic terms of questions of whether we are. Uh, actually acting in the 19th, 20th, or 21st century? And I think the answer is that we're, we're acting in all three of them. And depending on the developments that happen, the players that you're working with, you will see different interests come to the fore, different players, different, different tools. And I think the, the key in this case is technology as a tool. Um, that that the skills perhaps um, are 
similar and the requirements the same, but the tools are changing. And the other thing that, that you perhaps didn't have enough time to get into is the players are changing. You, you mentioned it with the multi-stakeholder model, but I think one of the great differences we see today is that it's not intergovernmental, whether, whether bilateral or multilateral. It's not strictly intergovernmental anymore. It's to, to advance one's diplomatic goals, there needs to be reaching beyond the, the governments, whether it's civil society, people directly, or, or business or others. And the fact is we all need to be able to use the tools of all three centuries. As you mentioned, the breakthroughs often come in very difficult, lengthy face-to-face -face negotiations, but there's been the immediate battle over Twitter, over press conferences, or whatever else, coming right out of those negotiating rooms or getting beyond the governments and winning over the, the other stakeholders that will have an important influence on, on whether these things succeed or not. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Peter, for highlighting this, that it's not either or. It's basically basically the, the complex uh, toolkit that uh, comes across the centuries from the very traditional persuasion, which exists since early days of humanity, to, to Twitter. And that interplay between negotiation in the room and signaling uh, outside outside the room. And uh, also the comments on uh, technology and, and tool and the multi stakeholder approach. Thank you very much for a most enjoyable talk and, and uh, expose and the result of research. Um, I would like to ask you to go a little more. Sorry, I'm the PR of Belgium, that's not the complicated. Um, I'd like to ask you to expand a little on what you meant by the parallelism on shrinking distances and then the distances coming back big time. Um, I'm not sure I understood the parallelism that you were drawing and how, in what way that the distances come back. Um, and specifically, I mean, do you predict that uh, the internet will be fragmented along geographical lines very soon, or what is the meaning of this parallelism? Yeah, another question. Hi, Ed Hap from the uh, International Federation Red Cross, Red Crescent. If I could add a, a technology point to the discussion that may be worth considering, uh, telegraph is point to point communications. Internet is multi point to multi point. And I'd argue that makes a fundamental difference in how the conversation and the communication happens. Mm -hmm. In addition, the Internet introduces something new, and that because it is multi-point and because it is incredibly fast, you have the ability for self-correcting information. And I point out Wikipedia, I point out the ability to, to correct incorrect information, even on Twitter, as a more modern uh, occurrence that we see happening. And those are fundamental differences, technology-based, than 100 years ago. Thank you. We have one more question, and then... Thank you. Uh, Jacques Markovic, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Maybe you can share with us a few thoughts about the same topic relating to international finance. Uh, while you are discussing the interface between Telegraph and Twitter with diplomacy, regarding international finance, it seems that seconds now are a reason to make or to lose a lot of money among countries and among people. So uh, if you did the same type of analogy, maybe you can share with us your thoughts. The, the first, the first uh, question from a Belgium um, ambassador on the, on the distance and geography. This question is, is, is uh, both philosophical and very practical. Somehow the narrative after the internet started was that we can delink from geography the element of virtuality, that we can be anywhere, but still we can be anywhere, but ultimately, physically, we can be, we have to be somewhere. We have to be physically somewhere. We can move faster, our data can move faster, but we have to be anchored geographically somewhere. This is important for Internet governance, because all elements of Internet governance are lo uh, located somewhere. Now, back to the, this, this question is, 
the end of ge geography, the end of distance exists, obviously, because of the fast communication. You can communicate easily. But then geography returns to the question of cables, to the question of the localization of the, of the use of the Internet. And the more telegraph and Internet very uh, moving to the user side and dissemination through the society, the more they, uh, they have been uh, uh, geographical because we have the real people who are using, misusing the Internet. Therefore, that, that, was, the, that, that was the major transition from early excitement to the end of the geography, because we can communicate to somebody who is far away, to the gradual anchoring into the geography. And the Internet became the major tool of the society. Now, it's not any, and now we are more anchored in geography with the GPS, with mobile, that, than we were 30, 40 years ago. It's very easy to know where I am, what are my moves throughout the day. Therefore, geography returned mainly through the GPS, a geographical positioning system, uh, big time to, to, to the, our uh, daily, daily routines. The second question, uh, Ed, is ex excellent. Uh, I completely agree that technology is uh, different. And you pointed to one probably major revolution, quiet revolution, it's social media revolution which happened five or six years ago with the blog, with the Twitter, Facebook, when the users for the first time became producers of information. And it introduced a new business model around the Facebook, Twitter, and Google. And it probably made a major breakthrough in this longer historic line. Because before that, Internet was either communication tool, email, or broadcasting website and providing information. That is highly uh, relevant point. Well, on the, on the, on the international finance, I've been hearing anecdotal stories about the discussion of milliseconds and moving, uh, servers closer to the Wall Street, but, um, that, that's not my, my field of expertise. What I can just, uh, indicate is that international finance was one of the first uh, fields, both in terms of telegraph and internet, uh, which basically started using the telecommunication for the faster transactions with many positive um, uh, impacts, but also with some, some problematic ones. And uh, there are some analyses that the quite a few financial crises throughout 20th century were basically facilitated, not caused, but facilitated to some extent by this fast exchange of information. Well, with this question, I would like to invite uh, um, uh, my fellow panelists to monopolize the microphone quite a lot to make the final remarks. and. Uh, and we have a, a remote uh, comment, just a quick one. Um, we have about uh, 10 participants from all over the world, uh, connected remotely from Mexico City to Belgrade. And we have a couple of questions, I'll select two of them. Uh, one from Alexander Mack, expanding on point four, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. To what extent did the telegraph and the internet serve as a channel for the ethical values projected by the major states in their particular era into international society? And then we have another one from Rodrigo Marcos. Has the creation of the IPU served as a model for current IG negotiations? Or IG negotiations are totally different from previous international negotiations on technology? Thank you. The questions are to you, I think. <laughs> uh, the, the, the question of uh, ethical values is, is important, and you can notice that there are quite a few initiatives currently. There is a change for the global uh, initiative of global justice in The Hague. There are the initiatives uh, of uh, reintroducing the question of ethical consideration in international relations. That's that, 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 that. The question of the uh, IQ and IG, uh, IQ deals with one segment of uh, internet development, which is telecommunication, telecommunication infrastructure spectrum. The uh, IG is much broader than, the, than that. It is both legal aspects, human rights, e-commerce, and the other, the other aspects. Therefore, some elements when it comes to telecommunication standardization could be very useful, and I think the internet community should uh, should benefit from the long experience of the IQ, but IG is much broader and involved a much broader set of actors beyond uh, beyond governments. Andre, please. Uh, I think we've pretty much reached the end of our time. Um, 
one of two, three, well, perhaps just for one point, that in 1914, the press was very active. People read a lot, and uh, they didn't read it as they would on Twitter immediately, but they read it within a few hours. Morning papers and afternoon papers, several deliveries of mail a day, which of course uh, seems, seems quite idyllic now. Uh, and decision makers were very concerned about public opinion. What will the newspapers say? But somehow, that, that didn't uh, determine their perspective. They decided in spite of public opinion, just as I think many decision makers decide in spite of what they hear on Twitter and uh, go on ahead as they would uh, otherwise. And, uh, yeah, I would like to focus a little bit on the dimension of time. I mean, you mentioned that uh, Willie and Nikki sent messages to each other, but when you look at the timing, I mean, they used 10 hours, 20 hours, and so on, and then, of course, there was the crossing, but uh, basically, it is my feeling that uh, in the old days, you had quite a lot of time, so you could ponder things, so you wouldn't have to go public immediately. I think this has changed totally in our area of Twitter and so on. I mean, we, we have to act in what we call real time. Immediately, you have to react to any kind of situation that is evolving from there, and limit your possibilities to, to think, to ask someone when you are foreign minister, something is happening here. But you have to command. So I think uh, that has changed also uh, the whole uh, way we work about because uh, the old days, diplomats read uh, newspapers, reported what was happening, where. Today, I mean, they would laugh at you when you report what is happening there because everybody knows, everybody can read this uh, on, on the internet. Uh, so you have rather to, to, to try to, to shape the news. For example, we should use Twitter much more. We should uh, tweet from meetings to give it a particular tilt that perhaps our kind of position looks very attractive or we, we have succeeded something here. Uh, and uh, just to end, uh, I had uh, a minister who didn't want us to, to, to report what is happening. She wanted to know everything that will happen in advance, proactive approach. And when you think a little bit about it, it, it's not just a joke, but I mean, you have to, to feel what is coming up. You, you, you have to predict the future. So our job didn't get easier. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe consult the horoscopes. Uh, uh, future tellers. Well, well, it seems like I'm the last speaker here. Uh, I would first of all like to thank uh, both uh, Professor Levy and uh, Dr. Kulbari for the really incredible presentation that they have provided us with. And I hope that this will not be uh, a one-day show and that this will continue and that uh, the Diplo Foundation will continue to follow the developments in technology and, of course, the Internet and uh, how it uh, relates to diplomacy and how it will help us in the future not to make the mistakes that were made in the past. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ambassador, and uh, thank you, fellow panelists, for uh, your great uh, great uh, comments. And thank you, audience, for being uh, quite tolerant with our time management. I realize that we uh, 10 minutes longer than uh, than uh, we planned, and um, well, that we use the, the Vienna Congress time approach, not uh, not the <laughs> this one. Once more, I would like to invite you to, to uh, thank the panelists with the, the floor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have seen some uh, Serbian uh, red and uh, Austrian white wine and some sweets, uh, Mozart Serbian and some sweets from Serbia. Please uh, help yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.